Hello. Hello. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, we're here today to talk about a book we wrote in five days, not, uh, not really all that long ago. Um, it was about a month ago, a month and a half or two. And, you know, the six of us plus uh, Diane Fleming over here uh, wrote this book in, well, realistically, we wrote it in, you know, three and a half or four days. And we spent another day, day and a half actually editing the thing down and <laughs> in an attempt to have it make some sort of sense. And there was also uh, one more uh, gentleman who was with us at the time, Adam Hyde. He was a facilitator uh, for the book Sprint. This is kind of a, a methodology that he developed during uh, his time with Floss Manuals. He actually helped found Floss Manuals. And today, we're just going to talk about that whole process of writing the book, uh, you know, the kinds of things we went through, the kinds of topics that came up. But I would like to put a little, uh, a little slight twist on this particular panel. You know, so many times during the process of writing the book, we kept asking ourselves, you know, what do people really want to read about? What is it they're interested in? What, what matters for them day to day? This was really intended to be, you know, the kind of guide that you give to somebody on their, you know, day one of when they're going out to start operating uh, OpenStack Cloud. You know, this is becoming, this is a job role, you know, operate this OpenStack Cloud for me. Where do you start? Well, one of those things could be handing them this book. So that was one of the uh, one of the uses that we envisioned for this book. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our fine panelists here. To start off, we have Anne Gentle. Anne, do you want to kind of take 30 seconds or so and introduce yourself? <coughs> uh, sure. So I um, coordinate the documentation for OpenStack. Um, and have since uh, Rackspace hired me more than two years ago. So, go write docs. <laughs> nice. Joe? Hi, Joe Topchin. I'm a systems administrator with Cybera. Um, and so basically, I'm an operator for most of the clouds that we deploy. Where do you operate those clouds? Thank you. From uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Excellent, thanks. Lauren? Uh, so I'm uh, Lauren Hochstein. I'm the lead architect for cloud services at Nimbus Services. We're a little um, company in the DC area that does uh, cloud services for engineering applications, and that's sort of like traditional engineering, engineering, like mechanical and electrical engineers. Um, and so I sort of wear two hats. I do traditional web software development, but I also administer our little prototype OpenStack cloud that we have the data center out in Ashburn, Virginia. In my copious spare time, I volunteer on the documentation. <laughs> nice, and thank you for that. John? I'm John Prue, uh, systems administrator at the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT. We operate um, about a thousand core cloud internally. My users, um, it, it's very much like operating a small public cloud, um, because I provide the infrastructure as a service, and then the research groups consume that through the API. Um, so even though it's an internal cloud, um, I don't really have much visibility into what my users are doing, uh, which is a bit of a challenge that um, you're more likely to see in a public cloud than most private cloud deployments. And when you say we, how big is that team? Um, the team that's operating the OpenStack Cloud, that's about a third of me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the royal we. It's the royal we. Um, th there is a, a larger group that um, I'm one of the senior members of. We have about a dozen people that operate the infrastructure overall. Um, and one of the things that brought me into writing this book is as documentation for those team members so that they could understand how the cloud works. I had to write the our internal docs. Oh, you're getting ahead of the game. Oh. <laughs> okay. I'll be quiet then. <laughs> Tom. Hi, I'm Tom Fifield. I'm the cloud architect at Nectar. Uh, Nectar's an Australian government project to provide cloud computing to the research sector. So we run a cloud that's uh, this year scaling from about 7,000 cores to 30,000 cores. And uh, we uh, have a whole gamut of the research sector, everyone from archaeologists to 
winemakers that are using our product. Yeah. Uh, that's really cool. Okay, and I myself, my name is Everett Taves. I'm a developer advocate at Rackspace. Uh, previously, I had run, uh, built, designed, and deployed uh, Cactus OpenStack Cloud into production. And that was one of the reasons I was uh, included in this book sprint. My job has changed somewhat since then. Okay, so let's get down to it. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, just a few easy questions. I'll first ask uh, you know, just a couple quick questions to the panelists. And we're also gonna start asking some questions of the audience because you know, we wrote this book for you. Literally, like for you, the people who are actually cared enough to come out to this panel. You know, we want to know what you think as well. And the kinds of things like, you know, what, what crucial topics did we miss when we wrote the book that matter so much to you, but are, are completely absent, or, you know, there's something really important missing from that topic in the book. We want to know that. So, you know, you can include that in a question to us, you know, where's monitoring, you know, where's quantum? We want to hear those questions. Was there anything in the book that made you throw the book across the room, you know, into the drywall. We want to know what the airspeed velocity of that book was. Okay, so panelists, why? Why did you want to help write this book? Starting with John. Well, I'll, I'll start because I started answering that earlier. Um, so like I said, I have a team of about a dozen people working on the infrastructure um, within the computer science lab. And we are looking to move more to OpenStack to provide some of the infrastructural services that we're currently providing on older platforms, um, in addition to this infrastructure as a service that we're, we're providing as a new service. So ha I, I needed to train my internal people uh, and document our procedures. And to the extent that this was generalizable to the larger community, I thought the right place to do that was in the official documentation rather than replicating that on an internal site, um, which is kind of hidden away from the rest of the world. Uh, obviously, there's bits that are unique uh, to my site, but I try and keep that to a minimum. Don't be shy. I guess I'll... So one of the parts uh, about my job, our, our cloud's actually quite unique uh, in that it's run by eight completely different organizations uh, using Nova Compute Cells to put it under a single API endpoint. So one of the parts of my job is to get these detailed design documents or architecture documents from these other organizations and review them. And very often they come in and you just really uh, have to either fly to their location and explain exactly how OpenStack networking works or go back and forth for about 20 email exchanges to try and get through to them that you know maybe you should consider using flat DTP multi-host HA instead of this other thing and uh, that's you know really an effort saver. Um, so from my point of view so I'm probably the person with the least system administration experience here since I come from a software development background, and I basically want it to be, so I like writing documentation, and I, I realize that's sort of a rare thing, apparently. Um, and I wanted the opportunity to just basically be in a room of people who had done production deployments of OpenStack. And so this was an opportunity to do both those things, to generate docs and actually be around people who really knew what they were doing. Um, so by the time we got around to writing the book, um, I had deployed uh, three different clouds uh, for Cybera. And um, well, the, the documentation was, was still pretty good and it got you know, a cloud up and running, but there was still a lot of day-to-day -day and operational and this weird thing happened to me and this is why it happened to me. A lot of those things were missing and a lot of uh, in-depth troubleshooting procedures were, were missing as well. And um, I thought that would be very valuable to, to have written and, and given out to the community. That was my primary motivation. Shall I go too? Um, so I am completely motivated by a very experimental way to write a whole book, 232 pages worth. 
And I had done a couple of book sprints in the past with other open source projects. So OpenStack seemed like a perfect place for us to try this technique. So Everett actually did a great job helping me recruit these. I didn't know that Everett had worked with Tom and flew to Australia and helped him set up his cloud. And so this group was just like this amazing, you know, collaborative group where we could try the book sprint method in a safe way where arguing was allowed and not too harsh. And I just felt like this group of collaborators could actually pull it off and they did. So my motivation was like, right place, right time, let's do it. And the foundation gave us 10K to do it. So thank you, foundation. <laughs> yeah, and my motivation was, you know, pretty similar to, to Anne's and Lauren's really. Um, you know, I, I was curious to see if this would actually work. Um, if this was really possible and, and to be a part of it, um, you know, whatever that meant. And also, I, you know, I, I knew a number of people already uh, who, were, who were planning on being on the team. And I think, again, it, it speaks to, I've been a huge community proponent of OpenStack since the, the very get-go. And I just thought this is an extension of that, um, just the, the power of the OpenStack community of being able to bring people together to do these kinds of amazing things, uh, developing, in this case, a book instead of developing code. Um, and then on the technical side of it, you know, coming from development background, I kind of wanted to make sure that the, the dev was in DevOps here uh, and, you know, illustrate to people how they can actually extend the functionality of some of the pieces of OpenStack without actually having to change the core code. Uh, so many times operators need the system to do that, that one little special thing in their environment you know, they've got some weird policy on their network or who knows what. And, you know, being able to show them how to do, tweak those things in OpenStack, uh, I thought would be hopefully, uh, you know, really valuable to them. And I guess we'll see how that plays out. So we talked a bit earlier in a, another session this week, uh, just yesterday, about, you know, how do we keep going with the book? You know, we want to keep this thing up to date. This is a living document. This isn't just you know, a book, we throw it out there, we throw it over the wall and forget about it. We want to keep this thing up to date. So one of our challenges that we, we discussed towards the end of the sprint, the end of the book sprint, was how do we get experienced operators to contribute documentation? There's so much knowledge in this community, just an incredible depth of knowledge, but, you know, dragging it out of the minds of some operators is not an easy thing to do. Um, so this uh, is the start of, you know, as much a question to the audience as it is to our panelists. Uh, would anybody like to take a crack at this? Did, did the questions get too hard too fast? <laughs> <laughs> too hard. So we actually worked in a system that just did HTML edits, and that was great for the in-person collaboration for that five days. Um, and it gave us an EPUB right out of it. But what we've done since is bring it into the OpenStack documentation workflow. So you have a Garrett review, you have um, the ability for me to work on a chapter, John works on a chapter, it mer all merges together because it's doing that on Git. So to me, I think that's the way it's a living, breathing document is because of Git and GitHub and our Garrett system. We can merge this stuff together. And I think the output is fabulous. Um, the other thing it enables that's really interesting to me is translations. So we already, I believe, have a Chinese translation of this book done. And um, that's how it becomes living and breathing. It keeps opening up to more and more groups. Uh, a hand. And the comment is, um, I note that there's quite a bit of colloquial language in the book. Um, and whilst there's nothing wrong with colloquial language, if your language is English as a first language, in translation that could become quite a difficult issue. Um, something to the effect of uh, a final example is if a user is hammering cloud resources. Now, we all know what hammering something can mean from a network perspective, a disk I.O. perspective, and so on and so forth. Um, but when you translate something like that, someone's going to scratch their head. Um, so, yeah, apart from that, though, I reckon it's an absolutely amazing job <laughs> you've done. So, I, I guess as far as the actual contribution process goes, um, so I, I didn't actually write anything for OpenStack 
documentation for the OpenStack documentation team before this book, but afterwards I've I've started writing, and it's actually quite an easy process, and it's almost a lot easier uh, than submitting code for review for OpenStack. You still have to go through a, a Garrett review process, but you're just sort of writing words and paragraphs instead of um, you know code structures, and you have to learn a bit of XML. So in terms of barrier to contribute to the book, it's it's actually quite low once you read through the how to contribute doc. Um, so from someone who was new to it as well, it, w it really wasn't that hard. I think uh, hammering is, is probably an Australianism from, from me. <laughs> Apologies <laughs> for that. <laughs> True confession. <laughs> Indeed. Busted. But uh, yeah, exactly. Just getting back to the, the comment about uh, gaining contributions to the book. And I remember when I was standing up my first production OpenStack Cloud, at one point got an email from, from a colleague of mine uh, basically saying something along the lines of, whoever touches the puppet config again, I'm going to cut your hands off. <laughs> and uh, yes, uh, is, you know, it happens. But uh, I think we can really capitalize on this, this frustration and anger that builds up when you are doing a sysadmin task that, or a DevOps task even, that is taking a lot of time especially if it's OpenStack's fault. Uh, even if it's not a bug, even if it's something that is more difficult than it should be, I think we should be encouraging people to vent at the documentation team or just put their vent in, in a bug report, just type something up so we can take it and not only add it to the book in case the code takes six months to, to fix, but also uh, use it to improve OpenStack. So I think there's sort of a, uh, this is sort of an open problem uh, in documentation, is how to get uh, feedback from, from sysadmins um, and how to get them to even just complain through formal channels so we can take that in and, and use. So I, I don't know if, if there's a plan for this. Um, just out of curiosity, how many people here are actually have a system administration background? By show of hands. Um, how many people have, uh, of those people have contributed to documentation in an open source project? any open source project. Okay. That's pretty good. That's good. Thank you. Um, so let me ask you people. So uh, for those who, uh, how many people have contributed to the OpenStack documentation project? Okay. That's less good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask, so for people who have contributed, for, for sysadmits have contributed to other projects but not OpenStack, what's kept you from doing anything? Even if it's just like, you know, complaining about some, you know, usability issue or, or a bug or, or anything like that? What's that? I mean, so. I, I can say that the thing that prevented me from doing to me for a long time was it's kind of gone away and it was... I just remember getting to like the, now it's time to sign the CLA and it's like GPG and I just like, my eyes glazed over, I, sh I shut down the screen, it was like seriously, I have stuff to do. But I know that now that's gone. Yeah, I think that's a fair comment. Um, you hit the, uh, the Garrett workflow wall of words and uh, it's, and especially if you haven't worked with uh, Garrett or Git before, it's, you just want to get going, right? But now it's just a button, so like now I'm contributing to it. Right, yeah, so great. It's, it's not that bad actually. Once you get going, it's not that bad. Question. So I think one of the things that's possibly missing in this is an appreciation that it's a relatively young project. There probably aren't a lot of people who have the experience there will be. And I think that that's the number of people around here that are interested already in this. We, we can see that users are growing. The numbers of users are growing. I think that's great. And I think there will be. This is a great start. I, I think this book is useful. I think it's going to help build this community. So. Certainly for me anyway, I felt that I was at a point where I could not contribute usefully until now. Thanks a lot. So I have one thing to interject. Um, Tom was mentioning complaining to the documentation team. <laughs> the the, the Acu documentation team is pretty much Tom, Lauren, and Anne. <laughs> um, the rest of us contribute you know, bits and pieces here and there, but it, if it's very small set of people. And Diana will start contributing to the book too. 
So, and we do have Diane now who, who is putting the serious time into, into documentation on it. I want to forget Diane, <laughs> even though you are blocked by the table. Um, so w we're not looking at you know, hundreds of contributors. So if you have you know, this one little thing that tripped you up and you can even submit a bug saying that you were tripped up by it, uh, if, if you can you know, make it over that little hurdle and actually enter the five lines that will keep someone else, that's fabulous. But if you can get as far as saying, this tripped me up, um, just in a, in a bug report, there's not a lot of people working on it, but at least then it's on the radar for someone to look into. Um, and I know that a lot of times people don't know the answer a priori. They have to go and, and research it or post to the dev list and, and get an answer for that to put it in the documentation. Um, and for the three of you who do that, I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I, I also just like to add one other thing, and that's if you're, if you're a sysadmin, don't be shy about filing bugs against any of the OpenStack projects, not even just manuals. I, I've, I've gone through this like cycle between some of the devs that are sort of horrified to find out that sysadmins are doing like shell script workarounds and like poking at the database um, because the devs don't know about problems that the sysadmins are having because there's no feedback coming back that you know X is too hard or you know th this doesn't make any sense. Um, and, and there's like a disconnect there. And so if you, if you ever want to, if there's something you don't like about OpenStack, um, you can file a bug with the ops tag against any of the projects. And they're, they're pretty re receptive. Um, they may not fix something right away, but they won't just say, you know, no, this is, you know, this is stupid. We're not going to change the way we do things. Um, yeah, if you're, if you're gluing stuff together with scripts, that you know, could very well point to a deficiency within the system that the developers want to fix, but don't necessarily understand the use case. Hi, uh, my name is Keith. First, I want to say thank you very much for uh, your work. It's very inspiring, inspiring so much that uh, working with the OpenStack Security Group, we want to try to do the same thing. So uh, in that vein, how important was the facilitator in making all this team come together? And if you guys had to do it again, would there be a facilitator involved? Uh, we have not lobbied for the 10K. We're going to try to do this on our own. Um, so. Give, give me some feedback, some directions, some guidance here. Having somebody to shepherd the process is very important. Um, I, I, very important. That's how I feel. Um, I had tried to do like maybe one day doc sprints in the past, and then I went to another one of Adam Hyde's book sprints and lobbied for the funding for Adam Hyde to facilitate. Yeah, it's just. Um, I have participated in enough that I knew I couldn't facilitate myself. It's a special skill that you have to practice enough that, um, and, I mean, he, he has gone to book sprints where he literally gets everybody in the room, but then he gets cornered in the kitchen on day one, and everyone was like, we can't do this, and you can't make us. So he had to work his way around, like, with that and through that, and you're going to get the book you want. You don't even know what it is yet that you're going to get, but you're going to get the book you need by the end of five days. So I... I knew I couldn't do it without him. So, yeah. And I found you guys an author if you're interested. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. We'll, we'll talk. talk afterwards. Right. Yeah, because I'm collecting people. <laughs> um, actually, I guess my comment is about the earlier question. I think a lot of sysadmins don't feel like they, that they have anything to contribute or that it's good enough. And so there's this fear factor that, you know, well, is what I'm going to do good enough? And I must admit, I'm sort of in this in that I've just, I haven't done for OpenStack yet, I just did for Fedora, uh, but getting into this habit of, you know, gosh, I've seen this problem, and I know, you know it took me half an hour or two hours, three hours to fix it, I should contribute this. And so one of the things you might do is look at mailing lists, and if somebody writes up a good answer to a question, send them an email saying, have you thought of it contributing this to the documentation? A Very suggestion. There's uh, one comment I'd reply to that with, uh, which is the <coughs> review process. Um, we uh, obviously, when we're going through this book, we kind of broke it up this into sections and we'd write a section and then mark it for review and then one of us would come along and review it. And you know, Sometimes we found syntax errors, sometimes the layout was terrible, sometimes there was words like hammering in, in there. <laughs> um, 
But uh, this, this same uh, review process actually exists in the normal OpenStack documentation. So it's possible to just uh, send in a patch and then someone else will, will have a look at it and uh, kind of mentor you through that. And uh, I've found that very helpful when I'm running code for OpenStack. Um, documentation is something that you can, if you know what you're talking about, just, uh, I don't know, more Australianisms smash out fairly quickly. Uh, whereas code, you have to think of all the test cases and this kind of thing. And having this uh, review process, I, I think, really helps. And uh, just being aware that the people are there to help rather than actually put a big red minus two on it and yeah. say this is wrong and this and that and the other. Um, I think that's something where we can improve the tone of our reviews, but it's something that might assist. Uh, so I, I guess another comment on that, on, on fear of contributing, and if you know if I ran into an issue, I, I'm going to look like an idiot for trying to post and either ask for help or say, hey, if anyone else runs into this problem, here's this. And um, it's 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 understandable, and but it's um, something that people really shouldn't be afraid of. This was the first OpenStack operations manual, so in a way, all of us were putting out these problems that we had, and there was you know. There was obviously a chance where it's like, well, everything you guys did was completely wrong, but it didn't turn out like that at all. It turned out where a lot of the things, everything that we documented was incredibly well received, and a lot of the goofy mistakes that are documented in the book have been like shared across, you know, all sorts of different. Like there was a, there was uh, an IRC chat log that Lauren pointed pointed me to where someone came in and said. I'm having an issue where my instance just randomly locks up, and if I log back in, then everything's fine. And someone goes, oh, check page number whatever of the OpenStack manual, and it's, it's the VLAN on VLAN issue. And that was incredible. Because, um, yeah, I, I felt like an idiot when I saw I did that, but I'm really glad that other people have now seen the solution to that. So there really shouldn't be a fear of saying, hey, I ran into this issue. Um, it's, yeah, just share whatever you have, and it's going to make a, a great um, knowledge base of, of issues and solutions. I got to attend uh, a presentation pretty recently, and the speaker was talking about contributing to open source communities, uh, whether it's documentation or code or what have you. And he himself said, you know, one of the things, and this is going to get a little touchy-feely, but, I mean, to effectively, sometimes to effectively contribute to an open source project, you need to be vulnerable because you're really putting yourself out there for peer review, right? And and all of the things that goes with it. And it's intimidating. I personally find it, you know, pretty intimidating. But, you know, if you kind of work through that and you kind of accept that, oh, you're putting yourself out there, you're, you know, being a bit vulnerable. And if you can distance yourself from your code or from your doc and say, it's not you that's being reviewed, but it's your documentation that's being reviewed. It's your code that's being reviewed. It's uh, it can be actually quite liberating, and I think you become a, a more defect, a more <laughs> more effective <laughs> <laughs> developer or documenter. What a Freudian slip that was. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Did we have any other questions, or should I ask another one? Great. a sort of humdrum question. What's the uh, release cycle going to be for updates? That was my question. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a humdrum question. It, it's, I think, an undecided question. Um, we did have a session yesterday discussing you know, what is the life cycle of this book? How do, how do we contribute to it? How do we, how do we release it? I don't know if there was a decision. Um, what? Th there were opinions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, this is the, the perfect question for the audience. I mean, like one of the things that came up in that session was, oh, there's, there's a handful of groups doing uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery. So, you know, the, the doc, the book just has to be updated constantly, um, simply not realistic. And in addition to that, not everyone is doing continuous integration and continuous delivery. Um, most people only have the resources to upgrade every you know six months or what have you. So, what would be useful to you? You know, when when do you upgrade your OpenStack clouds? And you know that might be presuming a bit much that everyone or even most people here have a OpenStack cloud right now to answer that. 
Or that they've upgraded it. Or that they've upgraded it, yeah. No, and, and intentionally so. That, that wasn't one of the objectives of the book. Um, but once you get past that point and you want to learn how to operate that new version, um, let's have an answer. So keeping in mind, if you look at things like the O'Reilly texts, and that may or may not be a good example in the context of what we're trying to achieve here, but, uh, and given there's only three core people actually on the team who are actively writing this stuff, uh, I would suggest maybe a yearly update cycle would be possible. Um, I think that would be maybe realistic uh, to say that maybe every year uh, the group should get together and, and, and you know, pen, pen an update uh, because within the space of a year you've got th those two sets of release gaps and maybe that's worth it at that point integrating. But uh, yeah, b beyond that, t to say every six months I think is too much and uh, to say any more than that is too much. So when, when you see like the OpenStack operator's Folsom guide, and now that Grizzly's out, does that actually put people off from reading the book, knowing that it's, it's you know, ver um, as the words say, it's a release behind, but right. even though a lot of the information is still very relevant, um, so that you don't find a problem with that at all? I don't find a problem with it because the book deals with, uh, with high-level concepts that, that still exist over there, you know, the blah, and this version is over copied into the original, it's, it's a higher yeah. Do you think that tagging the book with a Folsom release is a good idea or it should just be left out completely? Maybe editions of the book are important, but I don't think you need to say it's a Folsom release, it's a Grizzly release and so on and so forth. But editions and a year number or something is probably appropriate. Uh, maybe others have other opinions. that it's important to, in the book to say which release it covers, but you shouldn't have the book saying this is a Grizzly release. Uh, a slightly different question, Grizzly's just come out, and if I'm not mistaken, the documentation is still fulsome. And so if you want to go see Grizz Grizzly documentation, do you need to go to the Git repository and check it out? Uh, so we always publish continuously to docs.opensac.org slash trunk. And I mean, we might even merge like five times a day, some days. Um, Tom's pretty prolific there in Australia some days. Um, so you can always just substitute slash trunk for slash Folsom. Um, but one of the things we talked about yesterday was uh, we need to release the Grizzly docs, but they're not done because the installation isn't tested. So as a doc team, we decided last week, let's release after the summit, after the install guide at least is tested. After that, we'll collect bugs, just like our timed release code does. on the main page to say this is Folsom and if you want to see the Grizzly documentation that's in progress and not tested, go to this thing. Okay, yeah, fair. I was going to say it might be useful for you guys to talk about how you chose the reference architecture like how you made those decisions, because that was a big part of the process. Uh, do, do you now want me to mention that? Sorry. Thank you, Sam. I was, was going to say example architecture. Ex yeah, example architecture. Re reference is just such a loaded term. Um, but no, but that was actually, I mean, that's that's a part of the discussion as well. Um, John, do you want to? Yeah, so there's been a lot of talk of reference architectures in this room today. I don't know how many people have experienced that. Um, but obviously, we need something to talk about. Um, you, you can't talk about it in a vacuum, and you can't talk about all the different ways you would possibly permute all the different pieces together. Um, so we kind of took a target of what we operate and what we've seen people operating um, in, in mailing lists as sort of the best covered cases and uh, the most popular of pieces in use. Um, so we used you know, KVM as the hypervisor because that's what a lot of people seem to be using um, and mostly made our choices with, with that idea in mind. Uh, with the user survey, I guess we get to take a look at that and see if we were right. Um, <laughs> but that, that's mostly, I think, how we 
the discussion progressed. What did you think, Lauren? <coughs> yeah, I don't know if I have that much to add there. I mean, we had to write based on what we knew, right? So that's one of the reasons you don't see quantum in there. Um, and so you have to, and then this is a general problem with documentation, right? I mean, we, you know, if, if we haven't installed it ourselves, we can't, it's harder for us to, to write that documentation because we don't know if it's gonna break somewhere. Um, and so we, this was like a subset of everyone's knowledge or, or maybe a superset of, uh, the, so the example architecture was a superset of what everyone had a direct experience with so they could actually, um, right what they knew. I think you made a good set of choices, and I think you were also pretty clear that you had made these choices, and that they weren't the right choice, they weren't the right choices, they were the choices you made. Yeah, that's good to hear. Yeah, great. I have a general question, actually. Uh, do you plan to also incorporate uh, questions or discussions that happen on other online public forums like um, um, like ask.openstack.org or other places where people ask questions and there are others who give them answers. I just had an example of this where I had a problem with some Swift configuration. I asked the question um, and eventually I was able to debug it. I put the solution in there and I just later found out that one of the engineers who is active on OpenStack actually took that and put it into the documentation. This uh, apparently has, has happened in the last one week. I didn't even think about actually adding to the documentation, uh, but he already did that. But there, I'm sure there are many such, uh, I guess, tidbits of information or maybe even longer discussions that are already there on other public forums that could make it into the uh, ops guide and uh, make it into the book and that'll be useful for people. So I guess I can comment on this because uh, this is something that I try and do. Um, I read the mailing list every morning and uh, if there's something in there that crops up as something that is a, a common case that people encounter or something that's a bug, I try and add that to the documentation. The problem is there just aren't enough people to actually do things like go through all of ask.openstack.org or even the old Launchpad Answers site take all of the, the caveats and pointers and corral them into a document. Uh, if you'd like to start doing that, that would be fantastic. <laughs> um, but yes, we do try and do that. Uh, it's just basically limited resources, which means that we haven't managed to get all of the community's knowledge uh, together in one easy to read place. Yeah, I mean, I would say I, I, I agree entirely. So I, I do something similar, you know, we opportunistically you know, people who work on the docs, if we see something, we'll try to slip it in. Uh, I try to do that with blog posts. So if anyone, there's like planet.openstack.org, which aggregates a bunch of different um, blogs that are out there. Um, there's often a lot of good content on there. Um, if I see some, if I have the time and I see something that's really good on there, I will, we try to contact, we have to contact the author. We can't just copy and paste it in. We get the, almost everyone, no one's ever said no. I mean, sometimes people don't respond to me, but typically if they respond, they say yes. Um, and then we slurp it into the docs. Um, and you can get a lot from the mailing list, but it's really just a matter of resources. Um, so we do it when we can, but um, there's just much more content out there than there are people who can um, make the edits and put it in the docs. Okay, so it's six o'clock, I believe. Um, that's our, our wind up time. Did anyone have any closing comments they'd like to throw out there? Besides uh, pull requests accepted to the docs and the standard uh, open uh, source throw. I also want to thank Rackspace for donating these books. They actually purchased the print copies to give to all you. So I do have to send a shout out to Rackspace as well. They hosted in Austin, Texas. We brought in Yummy Tex Mix. And then they turned around and bought books for all you guys. So thank you, Rackspace. Great. Thank you, everyone.